Thank you, Jordan and Melody, for leading us in song. Today we are in Psalm 22, which, as you're, many of you are aware, we are going through the Psalms as typically a thing we do while we're between things. Uh, and this will be our last week that we are in a Psalm. Uh, next week we have Adam Nagel from Factory with us, and then the following week we begin John. So you may have seen out there already, there's those little uh, books, those little ESV journal books uh, for you to grab, free, free to you, uh, to track along as we begin our new series in John in two weeks. But today we have Psalm 22. So if you have your Bibles or uh, your phones or whatever you use to read along, you can feel free to turn with me to Psalm 22. And to be quite honest, uh, this, this psalm uh, has rubbed me raw this past week. I already have tissues prepared. Several weeks ago uh, at Factory on a Thursday night, I was chatting with a kid, as I normally do. And it's a, it's a, I've known his family very well for the last decade. And I knew some things were going on in his life that were probably hard, so I asked how he was doing. And it was met with the usual. I'm sure uh, many of you know this. Good. Good. But I pressed in a little further and asked another question because I knew some of his circumstances. I said, where are you guys living these days? Where are you living? Because I knew he hadn't been at the place he previously was. And the answer I was unprepared for. It turns out he's homeless, living with his, one of his older brothers in a hotel. And worse yet, his, his parents, people that I have known well, left him. They abandoned him. A sophomore in high school, now left to figure things out on his own. Abandoned by the the very people who are supposed to love him unconditionally. As I said, this is a psalm that's rubbed me raw, and as I'm several times as I'm preparing this, I'm just weeping. Because couple this with another kid that I currently know, I know well, who has similar feelings of being abandoned by his parents, uh, this kid currently lives with his grandparents. And they are, what's the saddest thing about his grandparents, you know, his, if his parents don't care enough, his grandparents are also pretty apathetic towards him. This too, a, a form of abandonment. And this is a kid that uh, is on my, my basketball team. And my heart breaks for him. No one comes to the games to see him. There's plenty of other parents and fans in the stand, but no one comes to see him. And couple this, couple this with the idea that at the core of every human heart, every child, is this idea, this, belong, this desire to be seen. We want to be known. We want to be loved. Everyone is looking for someone to look to them, to see them. So this idea of, of being abandoned is crushing. And then couple this with just some of my own Wounds as a child. Not knowing my own father. So again, this, this Psalm, Psalm 22, has just rubbed me raw. For it takes, it takes us to the very heart of the problem of suffering for a believer. This sense of abandonment. Of God letting us down. 
of God dumping us, of God forsaking us. There can't be many things more frightening than the, than the thought of God abandoning us. And not one of us is entirely unfamiliar with the problem of suffering. It troubles us. The death of a child, the diagnosis of a terminal cancer, history of abuse, mental illness. We don't have to search very far, even outside of our own walls, to find such stories of suffering. Why? Why me? Why them? What's the purpose of all this? And these are fair questions that wrestle with the very struggle of the psalmist here in Psalm 22. And before we read, you'll you'll see that we won't have to read very far to realize and become overwhelmed with the reality of the crucifixion because as we read and as we reflect, we, we see that David's story suddenly becomes Christ's story. As one commentator said about this psalm, it's the fifth gospel, the story, the account of crucifixion. In fact, Jesus himself spoke these opening words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? as if to draw us here when faced with his very own death. So let's read this psalm, see what it has for us, and and I'll read it in its entirety this morning, and then we'll reflect on it as I finish it. So pick it up there in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot pot shared. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Crushing line. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. There's a shift here. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For you have not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him. But he has heard when he cried to him. 
From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Though you slay me, I will hope in him. Job. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. It is finished. What juxtaposition that exists in this song. How can we start with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far off? To where we end with this last half. And as I mentioned before we read, this psalm is an incredible predictive prophecy of the death of Jesus. A thousand years before it would happen. And yet, it's incredibly accurate. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words Jesus utters from the cross in Matthew 27. In the mockery of verses 7 and 8, anticipates the mockery of the soldiers in Matthew 27, 31. And of the priests in Mark 15. The physical description of pain in verses 14 to 16, look at it, poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Strength dried up. The thirst of verse 15, pierced hands and feet of 16. All of these things visibly depict the horrors of the cross. And then the the dividing of the garments and the casting of the lots for them in In verse 18 of our text, the soldiers do this in in John 19 as Jesus hangs. All unmistakable evidences of Christ's very passion. And here we see how centuries before these events would take place on Calvary, the Holy Spirit is speaking through David to describe what Christ's, the Son of God, what His experience is Himself. What his experience will be. But again, the passage isn't all gloom because at verse 22 we we see that, that change in tone. Trauma becomes triumph. The cry of anguish that dominates the first half turns to a psalm of praise. And what begins so bleak ends with certain victory. It's finished. He has done it. And how can this be? Well, this is one thing we we hope to uncover as we walk through this text. So let's begin with this first part, the first 21 verses in which we see the trauma of it all. And if you're a note taker, you can uh, label our first part here as just that, trauma. What we find is Jesus alone and dying. It's traumatic. So we're back where we started. Why? Where are you? What are you doing? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Verse 1, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Carried through the first half of this psalm is this, this weight of experience mixed with the message of hope. And so often we we realize this, this is part of our own experience, experiences of suffering. We, we're feeling one thing, we, we know another, and we're not quite sure how these things go together. My hope is found in, in Christ alone, yes, but why? Does he, does he care for me? Why am I experiencing these things? Where is he? Again, what are you doing? Why have you forsaken me? We carry the the weight of experience in tension with what we understand to be true about God. 
Some would call it our theology. And with the psalmist, and and so often with us, we find ourselves in the midst of, of one seemingly contradicting the other. And we see the psalmist bounce back and forth between these things himself, despair and hope. He does this three separate times. And I don't know uh, that this makes anything any better for us. In fact, it can almost be worse that we're jumping back and forth. And look at this. You can see it here. Right after the deep anguish of verses 1 and 2, we have clear conviction in verse 3. Yet you are holy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 3, yet you are holy. Verse 4, in you our fathers trusted, and you delivered them. And so you see, past experience seems to suggest that God is trustworthy. Verses 3 and 5 is how it's supposed to work. This is what you did for my fathers, so I trust you will do it for me. But then comes Experience again in verse 6. But I am a worm of a man. I'm not, I'm not a human. So maybe it doesn't work that way for me. Which is followed later by the conviction of verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from my mother's womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you was I cast since birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. This is his present reality. This present sustaining of life would suggest that God is trustworthy. So we have past experience through through that of his fathers, and now we have this present circumstances of sustaining and nourishing ongoing from his mother's womb to now. He knows this to be true of God. But finally, we get this, this further agony of, of 14 to 17. This comes, then comes the, the but of verse 19. But, but, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Now we get future hope. The future hope of deliverance. So once again, the past experience of his fathers, the present upholding of his life, and the future hope, all the right thinking is here. All the theology is present, and it suggests that God is trustworthy. There is nothing wrong with the psalmist's thinking. No, but the the problem currently for him lies in his experience. There's nothing wrong with his theology because he knows, uh, end of verse 5, that God does not disappoint. He knows, verse 9, that God keeps us safe. He knows, verse 19, that God will help somehow, some way. But at this moment, the, the difficulty of it all lies in the reality that none of it seems to matter in the midst of where he is, what he's experiencing, where he's at in life. What good is it? What good is this correct thought? He feels abandoned. And this is at the heart of suffering. Utterly alone, cut off, uncared for, and on the edge of death. And this is what, this is what suffering does to us. It challenges us. It challenges what we think about God and it leaves us reeling. So if we're crying out to God and saying, God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you, what are you doing in my life? What is the point to all of this? Well, guess what? We're in, we're in good company. You're not alone in these thoughts. You're not alone in these words. We're in the company of, of the psalmist here, but also the company of Jesus. From the cross. These aren't bad questions. These aren't questions that we have to suppress. These aren't question that, questions that we should even avoid or be afraid of. But to understand all that's going on, the question we need to attempt to answer first and more fully is the question for us of, of what, what did exactly happen to Jesus on the cross? What did happen to him as he spoke these words from his very own lips? God the Son. 
At this moment, uh, at his moment of greatest need, was he too being abandoned by his father in whom he placed all of his trust? What happened to him? Some say that Jesus in his last moments lost all strength and faith and, and that's why he uttered these words. But this doesn't seem quite right as his cry is still a cry of conviction towards God. My God. My God. Others say that Jesus' cry, quoting the psalm, isn't quite real. It's not quite his experience. It's more of a, a show. It's just supposed to make us look to the end of this psalm, is what they might say. Which is about triumph. But this doesn't seem quite right either, as it negates his experience. And why wouldn't Jesus just quote the end of the psalm if, if that's what he wants us to look to? So what if, what if the right biblical interpretation is that his cry is indeed real? The abandonment that was foretold here in Psalm 22 did in fact happen. That Jesus was indeed forsaken. What if his experience is the experience, again, we see here in this psalm? Now, I don't want to pretend that this is a, an easy question to answer or something easy to explain. In fact, uh, Martin Luther uh, struggled with this, and after days of praying and reflecting on this in his study, he wrote, God forsaking God, who can understand? It is but a mystery. But at the same time, it lies at the very heart of our understanding of all that's happening in and around the cross. Which very much bears consequence for us today. So let's, let's look at it this way. Let's, let's reflect on Jesus' last few hours on earth. It is a picture of increasing abandonment and isolation as, he, as the timeline gets shorter. Uh, to begin with, there are 12 in the upper room, but then Judas betrays. 11 go to Gethsemane, but then only three go in. And of them, all of them fall asleep. Peter and John go to the courtyard, and Peter deny, denies Jesus, and then they all run. Jesus is becoming, moment by moment, more and more alone, more and more isolated, increasingly abandoned. But, but, in John 16, he is still able to say, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. He's holding out hope. He's not alone. His Father is with him. That's what makes this psalm even all the more crushing. Because on the cross, he says these words. On the cross, apparently the Father has left. What if it had to be so? And it had to be. Because who is Jesus? Well, Jesus stands in our place, bearing our sin. And this is what sin does. This is a consequence of sin. It isolates. It cuts people off from God. It separates. That's what hell is. It's a cutting off, a separating. It's an eternal loneliness, isolation, and abandonment. And in that moment, as Jesus absorbed the wrongdoing of all of our misdeeds, all of our sin, all of our shame, the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world, the separation had to be complete. body and soul, physical and spiritual, a real separation as the Father turns His face away and His wrath is poured out on His beloved Son. Sin, in that moment, came between God the Father and God the Son, and it hurt. It hurt both of them, deeply. As one theologian writes, the fatherlessness of the Son is matched with the sonlessness of the Father. Christ on the cross bears the loneliness, the separation, the abandonment of our very own sin. 
none of which were his own. He was spotless, perfect, blameless, without sin, and yet he bears ours. And this is his consequence. This is the consequence of sin. Once we start to consider then this Savior, you can see how our mind begins to to turn in gratitude for what He did. He endured in our place the God-forsakenness that we deserve so that we might never again need to fear or experience such abandonment by God. He took it on His shoulders. Interestingly enough, This is the only place in the New Testament which Jesus speaks these words uh, when the psalm is quoted that Jesus does not use a familial term for God. He doesn't say God the Father or my Father as if he suspends his own right to do so for that moment in time so that we might forever have that right. Our own groanings to call God Father. A secure relationship given to us towards God through Christ. Jesus was forsaken by the Father so that we might never be. Christ went there so we would never have to. And this is the first part of our psalm, the trauma. Then you see how we can move into our, the second half, this, this triumphant piece, because we see how the tone changes rather remarkably and abruptly so. And, and nothing we see from the psalm describes such a change. Nothing is explained. The sufferer's circumstances aren't told, but it's unmistakable that there's a shift taking place. Deliverance has come. He has been rescued. He is alive. He's triumphant. God, after all, Verse 24, has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted, affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. The psalmist realizes that for some reason, in the midst of his experience, oh, that, that God does see. God does know. He hears. He understands. He's strong and in control of even what appears to be off the rails. And this is is good news for the sufferers. Verse 26, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. This is something to be excited about. Again, given what his experience is, this promise is, is magnificent. It's glorious. It's something to share. Verse 22, I will tell your name to my brothers. Then 25, in the midst of the great congregation. 27, to the ends of the earth. And in 31, with people yet unborn. It's it's good news to share and tell. Go tell it on the mountain. Now, what can it be that excites the psalmist's vision like this? What can it be that he wants to take this news to the end of the earth? There is certainly nothing in in David's life that would would quite uh, seem to account for such a thing. What else other than the the death and resurrection of of Jesus can turn the tables like this, can can upset things, flip our reality? For it is the death and resurrection, after all, that these verses uh, foretell. And it's Christ's experience, his suffering, his abandonment, the greatest of all suffering, the greatest of all abandonment, which then also gives us the greatest display of deliverance, of triumph. You see, the resurrection is the proof that God-forsakenness is not the whole story. Yes, the weight of abandonment is felt through his death, but the Father also raised him to the position of supreme authority and privilege. What a paradox. The resurrection says and is proof that God is strong and he does care. It's proof that that Christ is alive. It's evidence that there is a purpose to life which transcends death in this present world and therefore then even our present experiences. 
that are unpleasant experiences and unhappy, unhappy happenings is not the whole story. For a time will come when everything will be put right and will be made whole. A time when brokenness is restored. And there are times in the midst of suffering that when, when we can't do much more than to hold on to that. Again, our experiences sometimes are just so heavy, so burdensome, so weighty, that it's almost hard to justify these things in the midst of such experiences. But there is, truly, there's a reason that the psalmist keeps going back. Hope how God acted in the past. Hope in, in how he's currently sustaining in the present. Hope for a preferred future that he promises. So even as the experiences are hard, we can at least hope in something. Knowing that we're not abandoned. Christ was the one that experienced the full weight of the abandonment so we wouldn't have to. I'm sure many of you have, have seen those, those inkblot psychology tests uh, where you're supposed to say what you see. Do you know what I'm talking about? It starts with an R, those Rorsch, Rorschach tests. You can type that into Google later and I'm sure it'll return something. But sometimes you just see nothing except an inkblot. But then someone tells you uh, what you're supposed to see, and then suddenly the whole thing becomes clear. And you're like, oh, a butterfly. Yeah, I see that. And from then on, every time you see that picture, what once was obscure is now clear. Oh, yeah, it's a butterfly. You can't escape it. You can't now unsee it. And nothing in the picture has changed. It's the same old ink blot. But your perspective, your perception is now totally different. And this is what happens to the psalmists here. It isn't explained as to how or why his perception changed, but in verse 22, there is an unmistakable shift. There is hope instead of despair. There is light instead of darkness. There is joy instead of sadness. So his perception changes. The picture for him is completely now different. Faith somehow allows the psalmist to see his circumstances from a different angle. We can only guess his angle, but what is ours? The angle of a Christian facing suffering is the angle of the cross and resurrection. This is the perspective that changes the mess and gives us a picture. A picture of hope, a picture of, of purpose, a picture of triumph. The only answer for the defeated Christian is a vision of Christ our conqueror. He conquered the cross, he rose above his suffering, he defeated the grave, and he conquered today because he is risen and working in power for us who believe. Ephesians 1. And that's it. This is, this is the trauma and the triumph. They are both here in our psalm, and they are both there in the cross, and they are both in our lives as well. So what's our perspective? Now, in fairness, perhaps you still find all this rather confusing and hard to follow. I hope not, but perhaps. All of our experiences are different. And so perhaps in your mind, uh, you're still stuck in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Perhaps your thoughts are, are miles away, struggling with some personal sadness or tragedy. And you're still stuck in the stage of abandonment. Well, I want to encourage you with, with three things. One, this psalm points to the suffering love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
we've seen the real sting of suffering is not the misfortune itself or even the pain of injustice or opposition that's against us, but the apparentness of, of the God-forsakenness of it all. I'm suffering, you know, I can deal with the pain, but I can't deal with the reality that God doesn't care. That's the, the real pain of our misfortune. The pain's endurable, but the seeming indifference of God and abandonment is crippling. At times, we are tempted to think of God sitting back in a sort of, of a lazy boy, a big comfy chair in, in the living room, reclining, sitting back and, and watching it all happen, indifferent and, and unmoved by the world going by, watching then, like a drama played out on TV, watching us suffer. But again, let me encourage us, that's not where he is. He's not on a big, comfy recliner, but a cross in the person of his son. The cross demonstrates that God is no spectator, no passive spectator. Instead, it shows us that he is, in fact, the main participant in the arena of suffering, the one most abandoned. He's the supreme sufferer. In that moment of real God-forsakenness there, Christ had assured us that however we feel, whatever we are experiencing, we need never to face and experience the abandonment of God again because He endured that. Christ has been there instead of us on our behalf. That's the first thing. Second, Christ understands your pain. Some of you are familiar with the, the writings of, of Johnny Erickson Tata. I heard her spoke at, she spoke at Moody many years ago. She was a, a young, able-bodied teenager uh, who became a quadriplegic after a diving accident, just like that. Her whole world changed. Entire life was upset. And in her books, she tells of her honest struggle with this tragedy and the hurt of it all, the struggle of it all, and how eventually she, she comes to a degree of acceptance with the purposes of God now in her life. And three years after the accident, she describes a conversation with her friend in which her friend uh, says of Jesus to her, you know, Johnny, why Jesus was paralyzed too. That thought had never really occurred to Johnny. She never really thought before that on the cross, that the pain of Jesus, the suffering of Christ, was real. His limbs were nailed. His skin pierced. Bruised. Beaten. But here it is in our psalm. And what was true of the cross was very much true of Christ's life. The realness of it all. He experienced poverty and sadness, racial prejudice and hunger, thirst and injustice and torture. He was tired. He was lonely. He was thirsty. He was sad. All of these things. There can be no more convincing of an argument that God cares and understands us at our core than the very life of Jesus. The supreme sufferer. The supreme endurer. And then finally, the third thing to encourage us is know that this psalm indeed does anticipate a glorious outcome. And that is a real thing. It's not some ethereal thing concept that's far off. It's a real thing. We end with this shift in perspective. It's the perspective of Paul in Romans 8 when he, when he writes that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is and will be revealed. Now it takes effort to some degree to shift our perspectives. It's not easy. It doesn't happen with the snap of our fingers. It doesn't even happen overnight. 
But the hope of this passage is that our present circumstances don't last forever. Jesus has indeed intervened, condescended from heaven to earth. He has given us a preferred future in Him. He has heard our cries. He has heard our anguish. He has heard our own feelings of abandonment. And in the midst of those things, in the midst of our experience, He is still mighty to save. That's the hope of Psalm 22. That's the hope of the Gospels. That's the hope of of everything in this Genesis to Revelation. The hope of a Savior that is mighty to save. wholeness, in fullness, in completeness, to perfection. Again, not like Eden where the possibility still exists to fall short. The possibility still exists to sin. No, that's eradicated. Christ our conqueror has given us a preferred future in which there is no reality of such things. No reality of sin nor death. He is mighty to save. Let's pray as we close. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can be together in your name, giving you the honor and the glory that you are due. God, I pray that as we reflect on this psalm, I pray that you would help us see these things. I I hope you would put within us even this, this idea that our experiences are true, that our suffering is real. That we're allowed to feel certain emotions in the midst of our experiences. And and you're not afraid of them. And God, I pray that you would continue to draw us along in light of your gospel. Draw us along in, in light of who your son is to us. Continue to give us hope. Continue to conform and, and shape our, our minds and, and our hearts into the image of your Son. God, I pray that we would even be a people secure enough in our own experiences to help others that are suffering. Even if if we're not all okay, that we could come alongside one another and bear one another's burdens together. God, I pray also on the flip side of that, that we would would truly be, be a congregation of people that rejoices with one another's joys. Again, that we would be a people that just do life together. God, give us the freedom to suffer. Give us the space to suffer well. And and again, make us, as a body, as a church, um, I pray that we would would be free uh, as a church to allow people to do that well. And that we wouldn't be afraid of it. God, continue to work in us. May we continue to be your light to an ever-darkening world. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.